Fiche, 10, recently and truly amazing, just wrote her first paper. Since Frank's is a cocktail lounge, it's not really legal for Sophie to be here. So in her stead, I will share a few excerpts from Swimming is Fun! Exclamation point. In my opinion, Sophie Shea embodies the exclamation point. Okay, in the pool, there are different levels for different depths of swimming. If you are just a beginner, I recommend that you stay in the shallow end unless you are with a parent, guardian, or in a swim class. How do you know you're in the shallow end? You know it's the shallow end because of its markings. This is a shallow mark, four and a half feet. It really depends on you. For example, if you are three feet and seven inches in the shallow end, then you want to be at the three feet mark. But don't go diving in. You might just bump your head. <laughs> Sophie was one of my first campers when I was working with creative theatrics at the Picnic House in Prospect Park, a summer theater program extravaganza for kids. She has always said, I have been going to camp longer than anyone. <laughs> and she's actually accurate. Sophie had her first camp experience before she was actually legal. You're supposed to be going into kindergarten before you can attend, but Sophie was only going into pre-K when she started. I didn't really realize until, oh well, it was too late, and then I just put it out of my head. I had a number of firsts at camp, my first first aid class, extensive two days of Red Cross training and certification. And you know how they always say in the CPR class, if the breath isn't going in, then the airway is obstructed and you need to clear it. Well, you know, I was stumped by that. I always had been. So and in that class, I finally asked because, you know, two days of training is serious and I wanted to be thorough. Excuse me, but how do you know if the breath isn't going in? And the instructor said, put your hand up against your mouth and blow. And I did. And he said, that's what it feels like. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I now felt prepared. I would know when an airway was obstructed. However, I was not prepared for my first head wound. I will never forget Rose Mincer Sweeney's face. She misjudged running underneath the monkey bars and bonked her head. She whacked it. I saw it happen, and you know what they say, but time actually does stand, kind of slow down, and I wondered, hmm, that was pretty hard. What is going to happen? Oh, <laughs> Will she oh, <laughs> Stoic and sunny little girl that Rose was, she seemed to be fine until the blood a massive amount of blood began dripping down her face. And when she saw it, that's when she started to howl. And that's when I realized the first aid kit should not be on a bench across the park. No, it should actually be with me, perhaps strapped on my person for easy access. <laughs> Head wounds bleed a lot. They may have said that in the class, but it didn't really register. Rose and I were both covered with blood, and I broke the very first rule of first aid, putting on the gloves, that's what you're supposed to do, because I just couldn't get them on because my hands were shaking so, so bad. But I did locate the source of the gusher, which you're supposed to do, and I applied a little pressure, and soon all was well. There were no stitches required. Amazing, with that amount of blood. Rose got to go home early, and her mom said, she was completely fine after an ice cream. Phew! <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Back to Sophie's paper. Then, after you've been in the shallow end for a while, you can go to the middle. The middle is deeper than the shallow end. So if it was up to your shoulders, for example, in the shallow, then you will be underwater in the middle. But not by much. <laughs> Another first for me at camp was children's literature. Once I started, I learned to read. As a child, I read a lot. A lot. But the children's literature that is pre-reading, it just it didn't happen. I didn't come from a reading to or together kind of family. So at camp, 
I was learning right along with all the kids about these wonderful stories that are out there in the world. And one week, we made plays out of Native American folk tales, which I just loved. And I was working with this first grade group with my friend Betsy, who is a movement specialist. And our story was called The Strongest One from the Zuni tribe. And it's about this group of ants who want to venture out into the world and discover who really is the strongest one so that they can learn how to be stronger because they think they're just a little weak and small. So they leave their colony from under the big rock and they start their journey and they meet snow who makes their feet cold and they think, hey, snow must be the strongest one. But they ask snow and snow says, no, the sun is stronger because it can melt me and ah, here comes sun. And so on and so on and so on. It's the wind, the house, the mouse, the cat, the big stick, fire, water, deer, the arrow. We know what the arrow can do to the deer, but if it is shot from the boat and it hits the rock, it will break against the big rock. So big rock, that big rock that the ants had been living under. And what they find out, those ants, that e is that everyone is, a strong, is strong in their own way and that the ants, in particular, the big rock feels that they are stronger than him because they take away little pieces of him and soon he will eventually disappear. Now, the big rock was played by Sam, a little boy with a very giant scar on his chest right around his heart. You could see it when he was in his swimming trunks and we went to the sprinklers. And now we hadn't been given any special instructions about Sam's health. Health. He was just a little boy. He was very sweet and he was gentle. Blonde, light, light of spirit. He was soft spoken, but that car, scar, something big had gone on. And he was brought to camp every morning by both of his parents. But Sam wanted to be the big rock. It was the only character he wanted to be. Sometimes the kids have trouble deciding they want to be everybody, but no, Sam was certain from the very beginning. So the big rock, it was. And the lines were always the same because that's easier for first graders. The ants would ask, blank, are you the strongest one? And then whoever they asked would say, oh, no, I am not the strongest one. The blank is stronger because it can blank, and here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> and then all that, yeah. So during our first rehearsal, we made it all the way through, and the ants asked Sam, the big rock, if he was the strongest one. And then this voice which can only be described as big and rock, <laughs> magically filled the entire picnic house. Oh no, I am not the strongest one. <laughs> and the whole picnic house just stopped. And Betsy and I looked at each other and the kids were just instantly unsquirmy, which was unheard of. <laughs> because Sam was so completely the big rock and he never wavered. Whenever it was time to be this, the big rock, Sam transformed each and every time. Talk about an exclamation point. That was like 14 of them. <laughs> I looked over at his parents during the performance and they were just holding on to each other and beaming at their big rock boy. <laughs> Now at this camp, the kids make everything. They make the scripts, the props, the costumes, the songs, and as an adult and teacher, I was supposed to guide them in this making, but I am very craft challenged. <laughs> Blue and paint are not natural for me, and there's no organic vision with any of it. But with the ant's headgear for this particular story, it seemed as if I might be on the verge of a craft breakthrough. I was thinking, yeah, yeah, maybe I've cracked this whole nut. The ants' headpieces ended up being uh, a quite elaborate and really stunning with these amazing antennae. I was feeling good. The ants were feeling good. It is amazing what you can do with a paper pla plate and some plastic cups. And of course, the ants wanted to play in their headgear prior to the performance. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We need to save them because we need to make sure that they make it all the way through. And when it came time to put on the antenna headgear, we did. And well, it was... Um, well, it was a faulty design. <laughs> it was top heavy and side heavy, it was back heavy, it was just wrong. <laughs> slipping off and sliding down, it did not work. 
And one of the aunts, and I swear if she wasn't sick, she'd think she was 72 and really over it. <laughs> Why do we make things that don't work? <laughs> it was actually a real question. So I tried to answer it. Well, I, you know, clearly we kind of thought that they would, and, and they don't, and that's it. Not satisfied, she repeated her question, which was now more of an accusation as she continued to try and, and work with the an antenna. Why? Do we make things that don't work? <laughs> and now, whenever I'm in the middle of something that doesn't work, I swear I can hear her voice. <laughs> oh, I had not cracked that craft thing after all. Oh, I was so in over my head. You know, and being in over your head, it may or may not be such a bad thing all the time. Here's what Sophie says. Let's say that you have water up to the top of your head, and you are four and a half feet, but you're not allowed to go into the deep end. Well, go to the middle. You can have the water up to the top of your head and still reach the bottom of the pool. But if you want it way above the top of your head, for that, there is the deep end. The deep end really stands up to its name. <laughs> there is a rune, the Norse stones and symbols that you pull out of the bag and they have messages, and one of them says, when in deep water dive. That's what camp always felt like to me, like the deep end in the best possible way. You know, as adults, we're so complicated and sometimes circuitous and perhaps removed because, you know, we have to handle things. And in the process, sometimes we become very, very hard to find. But when a five-year-old gets mad, they're mad. And when there's a stomach ache, it really hurts. And when a towel is lost, it really needs to be found. When you are offered a popsicle, you want a certain flavor. Okay, you may not always get it, and you get what you get, and you don't get upset. Uh-uh. You still want it. <laughs> Sophie Shea is one of my favorite campers ever, but there is also Nathaniel Winters. I spent six weeks with him. He was registered for the entire length of the summer program, and he was legal going into kindergarten. <laughs> The oldest of three kids, he had two baby sisters, and he came from smaller people. No six-footers in his family. He was impish, quick to smile, slow to laugh, but when he did, he could get silly with the best of them. Nathaniel frequently had nosebleeds. Don't know why, but he did. And he handled them. He knew what to do. He was not alarmed. He'd go, hmm, and off he'd go <laughs> to get some Kleenex in the bathroom. But one Friday, by noon... Nathaniel was on his third nosebleed, and it was too much. One nosebleed too many. He was moving very quickly to the other side. He was literally put into my arms sobbing by another teacher who went off to get another wad of Kleenex, and I just held him because I knew that Nathaniel would not die from a nosebleed. And I just held him and held him until his, ra his breathing became less ragged, and then we dealt with the blood and the nose. You know, Nathaniel wasn't really interested in drama or theater or storytelling, but he was always agreeable, except on Monday mornings. He would cry when his mother left, unable to be consoled, and only on Mondays. So I made him my assistant. And, and uh, he would help me take attendance. Um, we would check the path to the playground for, you know, stuff. <laughs> and count paper clips at the registration desk, and by snack time he was back to his agreeable self. And one day, it dawned on me, he misses his mom. He loves his mom. He gets to spend all Saturday and Sunday with her and his family, and then he's ripped on Monday mornings from what he knows and loves. He's only five. Of course he's bereft. Mondays. No one likes them. <laughs> People are grumpy on Mondays. Songs are written about Monday. Rainy days and Mondays. Monday, Monday. It's the Nathaniel Winter Syndrome. I can name ten people I work with right now who suffer from it. Nathaniel brought me flowers the last day of camp. And so far... Those have been the best flowers from a fellow I've ever gotten. Oh. Uh.
And in conclusion, <laughs> if you go to a water park, sometimes it might not have numbers on the side, so you really should ask someone that works there <laughs> to have a fun swim. Splash! Yay. Exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs>